It seems to me that one of the greatest secrets that has been kept from us and yet given to us by NASA themselves for the last three or four decades, they constantly tell us that there's water everywhere in space. But that's not what we perceive, right? If I told you there's water in space everywhere, you'd say, well, you're an idiot. Space is a vacuum. We know space is a vacuum. There's nothing there. And yet that's not the case. And when you start researching space and water, it becomes mind-blowing. Article after article after article after press release and press release about water in space in amounts that are completely mind-blowing. Ocean worlds, water in the solar system and beyond. In 2009, NASA found a sprawling cloud of cold water vapor around a solar system at a nearby star. The water vapor could eventually deliver oceans to dry planets that are forming in the system. It's water vapor. It's not water in some weird thing. It's water vapor they're talking about here. Could eventually bring oceans to new planets forming. This is just a little disturbing. And just hold on to your faith. The famous Eye of God, Nebula, actually weeping tears of water. Wow, so there's water coming out of this nebula. This is not just a solar system. This is a nebula. This is a place where galaxies are born. Stars and galaxies are born in a nebula. And water is coming out of this. Can you imagine the size of the water that's coming out of a nebula? It's like one drop of that would engulf our entire solar system. And it just goes on. You know, oceans detected in, inside Saturn's moon and stars found shooting water bullets. NASA confirms best ever evidence water on Mars. Water from Orion. Now there's water coming out of the constellation of Orion. And, and this is a big one. Star found shooting water bullets. I mean, a, a star shooting water bullets. A star is supposed to be a sun. There's water on a star? I, I um, challenge you after this this evening, go to the pub tomorrow, strike up a conversation with somebody and tell them, did you know that there's water on the sun? What do you think they're going to tell you? You're a freaking idiot. They don't have enough information. So, it's to, we're getting to this point now that you can't have a discussion with somebody about any subject unless they have sufficient amount of information. Because they'll constantly block it, block you, tell you you're stupid, and so forth. So, it's tricky, and we have to navigate this river of discussion and debate very gently and very carefully because we're going to lose friends and families and break up partnerships because of new knowledge and information that some of us embrace and others discard as BS. So then they do a study, NASA, and they say basically all stars have water. This is the conclusion. Uh, I'm not going to read the fine print. You can do this yourself. All stars have water. That's the conclusion. And Stella Sprinkler nourishes galactic garden. Wow, I didn't realize there was a garden out there in the cosmos. It's being watered by some Stella Sprinkler. That's lovely. I'd love to see this garden. I wonder how big those plants are, dude. Man, wow. This is like bigger than the tree in, on, on Pandora. <laughs> and, um, and then water on the sun. Stanford University. She tells us that there's water on the sun. And even better, a more appropriately named university, Waterloo University, tells us that there's water on the sun. And I'm going to leave this here because you need to go and do some of your own research here. It seems to me that the universe and the water are the same thing. On the left is one of those deep space images of the universe. On the right is a picture of a swimming pool. And I think you start seeing what's going on here. And the lies and the deceptions are getting bigger and bigger. Also keep in mind that many of the images that we get shown by NASA come from radio telescopes, not from optical telescopes where they actually photograph an object. It's a radio telescope that brings radio signals and then they convert those into beautiful images through NASA's artistic impression graphic designers. Right? So these are often you don't see pictures. These are radio telescopes. Our entire, our own very, our very own solar system is completely surrounded by water. 
They tell us it's ice, but can we believe them? Is it ice or is it water? Like water vapor, like that other thing. I don't know, but we call it the caper belt. It's a belt in a disk that surrounds the outer perimeter of the disk of our own solar system. Our solar system is a disk. Keep that in mind. I'm going to come back to this. So is the caper belt this huge amount of ice, right? And that, that whole thing is now completely engulfed by more water called the Oort cloud that completely engulfs our entire solar system. It looks something like that. So suddenly, our own solar system is made up of water, surrounded by water, and yet there's supposed to be vacuum in space? How does this work? Where does that vacuum in the water, how does that break up? How does it work? Where does the water go? Where does the vacuum begin or end? And it's, it's a little confusing for me. But we know that there's water in space because they keep telling us there's water in space. So suddenly, uh, the Bible makes a lot more sense to me because I've always had a problem with one of those statements in the opening phrases of the Bible, when the Spirit of God moved over the waters. How can the Spirit of God move over the waters when nothing has been created yet? Surely water should be part of the creation. And I'm starting to see now why water is so sacred. Is it possible that water is so sacred because water is actually foundation of all creation or is connected to all creation? Well, if you look at chemistry, it seems like it because between oxygen and hydrogen, you've pretty much the same, got the same elements in every other chemical reaction or chemical formula. Hydrogen and oxygen are part of pretty much everything. You cannot separate it. Hydrogen and oxygen make water. So it starts to get a really interesting and compelling to think that Water is actually made up of space. And God said, let there be light. So the Spirit of God is moving across the waters, and it's the sound of the Creator that makes the light. How does that work? Well, in modern science, it's known as sonoluminescence. When you put a sound frequency into a body of water, after a little while, a beautiful bubble appears filled with light. Sound in water. Sonoluminescence. God said, let there be light. Is it possible that water is the stuff that holds the universe together? I'm beginning to believe that. I'm no longer believing the lies of NASA and their fake CGI images that they send us and give us. Sorry. In 2013, astronaut Luca Parmitano almost drowned on a spacewalk. How does an how, how astronaut almost drown in a spacewalk? And they covered it up by putting out a press release. So it's like it's, they always have a back door. They always have a back door out. But if space is water, where does the watery space begin? Where is the edge? Well, if we start listening to what the Bible tells us in some ancient scriptures, maybe we should listen to all of it. It says, God placed the firmament in the sky to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters below. I have no idea what that means, but I'm starting to get an interesting picture. And then how did God create the flood? It says, tells us that God opened the gates of heaven to let the water pour in on the earth. Okay, now I'm starting to see how you can create a flood. If, water is, if space is water, it's starting to make more sense. And then suddenly, vacuum just becomes a myth and not a scientific fact. Because the simple basic physics of a vacuum in space is just doesn't work. If there are any scientists that actually just Think about this, or physicists. The, the whole thing of vacuum in space is just not compatible with any kind of physics formula or physics that we can put to it. Where does the vacuum begin? Vacuum is one of the most powerful forces of nature. Where does that vacuum begin? We often get confused between gravity-free and vacuum. They're not the same thing. Just because there's no gravity doesn't mean you're in a vacuum. And just because you're in a vacuum doesn't mean there's no gravity. The two are not the same thing, so don't get confused by vacuum and gravity-free. What you can't do in space or in a vacuum, what you can't do in infinite vacuum is you can't propel sound, you can't have explosions, fire, propulsion, jet engines, rockets, none of this stuff. Can't do that because there's nothing to propel against. And then these guys on YouTube that make these vacuum tubes, they go, oh, look, I created a vacuum tube in my garage. I'll show you that you can propel a rocket in a vacuum. I go, really? You've lost your brain. You're comparing a fishbowl in your garage to the infinite vacuum of space? You really lost your mind, dude. 
And, uh, and then you start watching like SpaceX sending a rocket up into space and the very well-trained uh, presenter that's got all the buzzwords, she knows all the lingo and all the buzzwords. And at one stage I was watching and she says, and the rocket is about to enter the vacuum of space. Uh, really? And millions of people are watching this and they believe this, you see? They just, oh, the rocket just entered the vacuum of space. Where? How, how did it, Where? Please freaking explain that to me. In scientific terms, not in BS terms. Oh, you won't understand it. No, please try me. I want to understand this. Explain to me where that vacuum begins. And we start realizing that everything we've been told about the moon, moon landing, space, is probably one of those big hoaxes. It is a tough one to swallow, but we're going to have to start swallowing it sooner than later. The sooner they, the longer they string us along, the longer this is, the worse this is going to get. So, for those of you that still believe that we landed on the moon, I'm going to shatter that for you right now. If you've not seen Jay Widener's Kubrick Odyssey, that's the first point of departure. Watch Jay Widener's Kubrick Odyssey, and you will never believe another word NASA tells you. You will never ever believe that we landed on the moon, and you'll understand. Um, Stanley Kubrick's role in this entire thing and why he eventually died when he pushed it a bit too far with eyes wide shut. But basically everything you've ever seen from the moon or the images or footage of the astronauts was shot by Stanley Kubrick in the early days. I'm not sure who shot the, the more latter part, possibly him as well. Um, but the earliest uh, moon landings and all that shot by uh, by Stanley Kubrick with his very, very specific style of cinematography. It's a dead giveaway, and uh, that gave him a, basically the freedom to make whatever movies he wanted. He then made a movie called The Shining to tell us that he was the guy that shot the moon landings. And for some people that still think the moon is a, is a real physical thing in the sky, that we landed on this physical object in the sky, the image of the moon that we see from Earth is part of the agenda. It's part of the particle physics agenda that I'm coming to, to make us believe of particles that make up everything in creation. And we need to reconsider what the moon is, because after you've seen the lunar wave, you'll never think of the moon the same way again. And this is what the lunar wave is. The first one was filmed in 2012, and it's this weird electronic glitch that, that goes across the moon. Every so often, it's been filled hundreds of times now, not just by one person, but by many other photographers with very high definition lenses. And pay attention because it's like the old computer and TV screens. You see this line, this electronic line move across the moon, follows the edges, the contours, and the line moves from bottom to top, from side, from left to right. It moves in all different directions. This has become known as the lunar wave which gives us a very clear indication that the moon is not what we think it is, and it's most likely a hologram. All right, welcome to the Crow Discovery Project. Uh, again, this is the 2012 lunar wave footage, the best example of the lunar wave that we have. And I'm going to show you some things that sharp-eyed followers have there? spotted long, long ago and that I have talked about, but I have never taken the time to carefully illustrate. And what I'm going to show you here means an awful lot. But I'm also going to show the pulses that happen in the lower left limb of the moon. So watch the lower left there, and I'm just going to run a straight, slowed down view, 30%. If you've got sharp eyes, you'll see what we detected on a 60-inch monitor. Now look inside the circle. There's a pulse that goes from lower left to upper right, and in the next circle, the yellow one, there's a lateral sweep that goes from left to right straight across the screen. And this is all going on as the wave is starting at the bottom. So now look at the pulses backwards and forwards. That's backwards, 
this is forwards coming from the lower left limb of the moon you can see the pulses now that I've put filters on them how they have a curved aspect to them and if you've got sharp eyes you'll see the sweep up above now what I'm going to show you now we have talked about and many sharp-eyed viewers have known that this was an important thing about this clip for a long time here comes the wave look at the dark underlined crater in the center of your screen watch how it's displaced almost like you're looking through water there goes the wave backwards forwards the wave hits the crater displaces this wave is displacing as if you are looking through water the entire image of the moon now I've never taken the time to animate this I have talked about it there it is zoomed in now this is running at 30 percent and I'm going to zoom out there goes the wave to the top and there's going to be another wave coming in from the bottom now I'm going to run this at 30 percent so as the wave comes in you can choose any landmark you want here comes the wave from the bottom to the top choose any little landmark you can see there and watch it be displaced now that round looking ring crater forwards backwards forwards backwards and one more time forward and I'll zoom out and you can watch it go all the way to the top again this is at 30 percent with quite a few filters like find edge and some other things invert okay I think you get the the gist of that uh, this has been filmed many times now not just by one person so it seems to me that uh, that we're not looking at anything physical and that this hologram or whatever the hell that is is possibly hiding something that's really behind it um, and then the, the Mars landing, you know, and, and when, when we first landed on Mars, I got so excited. I was just really excited about the Mars probe and all the pictures from Mars. Boy, it was like one of the happiest days of my life. So for me to come to terms and admit that this is probably a hoax is just really a tough pill to swallow. But unfortunately, we have to swallow these pills because when you start researching the whole Mars landing and uh, and the experiments and the, the training they did in the Canadian Arctic on Devon Island, I suspect that pretty much everything and all the footage we've ever seen on Mars was actually just shot on Devon Island, very far northern Canada. And uh, it's depressing, but that's what it is. And we've got to deal with it.